I don't know, there's just, if you really look around and step back, there's so much to be grateful for, so much, you know, that we are blessed with living in this like modern era, modern society. Despite all the chaos that's going on, I think there's 10 times as much good things going on. You just gotta look for it. Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve. Welcome to the Dream Big and Think Different podcast, where we inspire, impact, and empower. Progress is impossible if you always do things the way you have always done things. It's time to dream big. Here's your host, Dr. Sachin Maskey. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Dream Big and Think Different podcast, where our mission is to inspire, impact, and empower millions of people. I'm your host, Dr. Sachin Maskey, and I'm Today here with my special guest, uh, all the way from Salt Lake City, Patrick. Uh, how are you doing today? Welcome to the show. Uh, I'm great, Sachin. It's, uh, it's awesome to be on here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so today is uh, the guest I've been always waiting to bring to uh, my podcast to discuss a few things, especially we're going to focus uh, on the whole life policy. And uh, I want to just put out everyone today this disclaimer that I'm the client of his great company called Paradigm Life. And I do not have any financial or any affiliate program where I'm not, basically, I'm not getting paid to do this. So basically, uh, today is basically financial education and, and, and trying to learn more about it. I want to start with uh, a little bit of background of uh, Patrick, uh, the intro. The, so basically, he's the founder and the CEO of the company called Paradigm Life and also PL Wealth Advisors. Uh, Patrick has and his team uh, teaches thousands of people how to build wealth. Uh, create lifetime cash flow and leave a meaningful legacy to the family and, and the world. Patrick was recently honored uh, by in- Investopedia as one of the nation's top 100 most influential financial advisor. Uh, he is highly sought uh, after presenter and speaker at financial-based events around the country. And he's also the host of the uh, wonderful podcast called Wealth Standard Podcast. Uh, Patrick grew up in the West Hartford, Connecticut, which is basically... Uh, I would drive from my place right now. He lives in Salt Lake City now, and he has uh, three kids, and he lives with his wife. Uh, again, welcome, Patrick, and how are you doing today? Life's good. Life's good. It's, uh, it's a little cold, a little snowy, but uh, it's the holiday season, and just grateful uh, grateful to be alive, grateful to be talking with you today. Sure, thank you. Same here. It's a beautiful day today. Even though it's a December, we're still in 50 degree. I cannot believe that. <laughs> So my first question today, I always ask my, uh, my guest is, um, it's kind of a philosophical question, but who is Patrick and why he's in this world? <laughs> oh man, that is such an interesting question uh, and very deep. You know, I've done a lot of personal development work and, you know, I've come to, to realize that I'm uh, a unique to anyone that's ever existed. Uh, I'm special. I'm meant to do a lot. I'm meant to meet certain people. I feel like, you know, even the people I walk uh, down the street and see, like for whatever reason, I'm meant to interact with them. Uh, I've just come to a realization that, you know, my purpose is to be myself and my best self in those moments. It's to extract as much joy and fulfillment out of life with really no expectations and no strings. And uh, it's taken, it's been a hard road to get to this point, but I feel just super grateful to meet people, to interact with people, to feel people's energy, to understand where they come from, to figure out how to create value for them, uh, to share, you know, meaningful moments. I mean, if you step back, life is just a miracle. And I feel just blessed to be able to to take in just everything that it offers daily. I don't know. There's just, if you really look around and step back, there's so much to be grateful for. So much, you know, that we are blessed with living in this like modern era, modern society. Despite all the chaos that's going on, I think there's 10 times as much good things going on. You just got to look for it. I uh, totally agree. And I know that was a very deep question. And I, I wanted to ask that because my... You know, whole part of the podcast is called Dream Big and Think Different. And the mission is to impact, inspire, empower people. I think with that, uh, I, I love your answer and I appreciate whatever you're doing. 
and helping people. And, you know, that's my goal too. My next question is, uh, again, about dreams. You had a dreamer. So what was your childhood dream when you were a child, Axel? And I want to go with that, you know, and go from there. Uh, I think it ch- it changed over the course of the time. You know, I I obviously, like most uh, boys growing up in the Northeast, uh, you know, I dreamed of being a, a professional hockey player. And, really? it, you know, my dad was a my dad was a coach for for 40 years. Wow. And I grew up at a at a hockey rink and played in college. I uh, got to go to a pro like it was like a, spot, a spotlight camp in uh, Minnesota for the San Jose Sharks and I learned very quickly that I was not meant to be a professional hockey player. <laughs> so it's it was a great experience but you know I I also, you know, looking back, you know, I I didn't like to be told what to do. I I didn't believe and I didn't know how to articulate it at the time, but I didn't believe in the status quo. I didn't believe in doing things the way that was just was done. This is the way to do it. Just do it that way. And so I've always approached uh, business. I've approached finance. Uh, I've approached, mm-hmm. uh, you know, even my wife. I've been married for 20 years, but my wife is from this really poor place in Mexico. And so I didn't, I, I, I've just realized that I haven't, I haven't approached life in the stereotypical, you know, status quo way. And I don't know, I, I feel that that's, it's something I grab hold to and uh, I embrace now as opposed to, you know, feeling different, right? Which I definitely have had those reservations or had those, you know, feelings about myself in the past. But now I embrace the fact that I look at things different. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Uh the next question, I'm going to jump to a little bit uh, different uh, category of question, but uh, I want to talk about your book. Actually, I have read the book <laughs> and I, I, I think it was very, very inspiring and to learn a lot of things that I wasn't aware of. So let's, let's talk about the book called Heads I Win and Tell You Lose. I don't know when did you write this, but tell, give me more about the book. Like, uh, you know, what is the reason you wrote the book and, you know, how to help our listener. Sure. So I wrote, the book came out in 2018. Uh, and so I, I started the, I started the company in 2007. And, and so the book is the culmination of not all of the experiences, but I would say the, the most impactful, uh, experiences, uh, just being in financial services, giving people, people financial, uh, advice, uh, finding solutions that work. Uh, and then just telling stories around people who use, uh, you know, our financial strategies to improve their life. Uh, and, you know, you notice in the book that there is that philosophical approach. Right. Right. And the philosophical approach is finding ways to, to be free. I think we're driven as human beings uh, to not be dependent on others, to find freedom, to live in a fulfilling way. Uh, and oftentimes, whether it's media or other influences, they get in the way and it's frustrating for people. And I get it and I continue to see it to this day. So the principles of the book really were, were well thought out. I had planned on writing the book for a really long time and just, you know, accumulated ideas, stories, principles, uh, and ultimately, you know, found a, a really good publishing company that helped organize it and make it simple because sometimes I have, I delve in the, the complexity. <laughs> That's kind of how I think in a sense, but right. you know, the publisher helped me really write in a way that was clear to, uh, to most people. So it was a, it was a fun process, definitely a labor of love, but, uh, def- it was worth, uh, you know, it was worth, worth it because yeah, it sold a lot of copies and it's, uh, you know, made an impact in people's lives, which makes me feel good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I read the book again. You know, I would highly encourage everyone to at least read through. And I think you have an audible too, and is is you know very easy yeah. to read yeah. and and easy to read and a lot of uh, golden nuggets for sure. So I would again highly encourage people to read the book. The next one is a podcast. So I see that you have, you also have a podcast, which is uh, named as the Wealth Standard Podcast. Uh, so I wanted to know, you know, what is it about and why did you start that too? Sure. So the podcast started on a, uh, on a fluke. Uh, this was actually before I started uh, Paradigm. It was within months of starting it where uh, some other partners I had had an AM radio station show. 
and they weren't going to be available in a, on a morning, but the show was going to go live. There was some emergency or something. And so I was in the office and they're like, Hey, does anyone want to go on and be on the radio? And I was like, I'll go, I'll go. Yeah. And then I, you know, it, so that was like 2006, I think 2007. Oh, wow. And it, yeah, so that's kind of how like the whole recording thing started. And then I had an assistant at the time who said, Hey, we should take the recording of the radio radio show and do a podcast. And I was like, what's a podcast? Like, I know no, I mean, podcasts had just come out. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've, you know, I've done one, you know, I actually, in full disclosure, uh, I went on kind of hiatus uh, last year. So the last episode was about a year ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to come back, but I just, I stepped back and uh, really focused on some core initiatives and projects at Paradigm. And it, it's, it's actually to, you know, be a, and I don't want to talk too much about it because it's not really relevant to the show, but it's a, it's a way in which we can distribute and create value at scale. And the podcast, you know, really didn't have that uh, distribution method. So I, I, I ceased doing the podcast for a season. Uh, but all the episodes are there. There's several hundred episodes. Most of them are, are really relevant, even though a year has gone by. Uh, but the plan is to start that up in February of next year. Oh, okay. Are we we're excited so. to definitely excited to, you know, listen to the podcast when you're back again. But, uh, yeah, it's interesting to know. Um, my journey started just recently, but uh, you have been doing this for a while. So I thank you for doing this again. So now we're going to change a little bit uh, the gear here and talk about your company. Actually, before I go to the whole life policy, I want to know a paradigm life. And I didn't know that was in 2007. And I really, again, I'm a client of your company. I am very, very fortunate and I'm grateful to you know, work with uh, your expert uh, advisor there and they're very easy to work with. I have, you know, full disclosure again, I'm not getting paid for this and I, I appreciate what you guys do. And tell me more about your company, why you started and and uh, what do you do? Sure. Well, it, you know, it really started when I got a, a job at a call center in in college and the call center helped people consolidate uh, consumer debt. And it was just a college job, um, but I learned just how much people struggle with money. And it's not at, you know, in a certain demographic or, you know, an age, an age range, it's all over the map. You know, people that are really wealthy from an income standpoint, uh, but those who are, you know, middle class, upper middle class, I just started to experience so many people just struggling with debt. Yep. And, and that's when I started to realize like, wow, something's not right. Uh, and then during that stint, there was some legislation passed, uh, some bankruptcy legislation, because this helped uh, people avoid bankruptcy. But what happened is it hurt banks mm -hmm. because there was some legislation in it, you know, that uh, the call center used to help negotiate credit card debt, consolidate it, lower interest rates, which hurt banks. And then they, you know, came out with this new legislation that was likely lobbied by banks to remove that. And, and so I, I saw all of that happening and realized, wow, banks, financial companies have big influence on law. And then I also realized like people are struggling with finance. So that's where it began. Okay. And, you know, in 2007, when, uh, you know, I met a, uh, a mentor, uh, and she had been, a financial advisor for several decades and followed a certain methodology that was different than the typical financial advisor. And, and I, you know, for me, it's like, I always connect, all right, if the status quo worked, then the results would show that it worked. And right. the experience I had right. people losing money in investments, people uh, having struggles with credit card debt and spending and managing their finances. I'm like, the status quo doesn't work. There has to be something that works. And so that's when I connected the dots. And I was so compelled by what uh, she was doing and the results she was getting that I decided to completely shift my career. And I convinced partners uh, to uh, seed or fund the initial uh, business Mm -hmm. And uh, and it went really well. And then 2008 and 2009 happened, and they had some big challenges. I absorbed a bunch of their debt. I didn't know what I was absorbing, and so I got into trouble with like you know not being able to pay off 
uh, debt. I finally, you know, settled with credit cards, avoided or with the credit companies, avoided bankruptcy. But it really, you know, the business took off in 2010. I almost went out of business in 2008, 2009. I was like, my wife was like, just go like work at Home Depot or just go get a job. Like yeah. it was, uh, yeah, it was a crazy. Yeah, it was a really crazy time in 2008, 2009, even 2010. But, you know, just that's how the universe works sometimes, right? I struggled through it and just met a few people and one thing led to another. And, you know, here we are Here we are today. We've got 8,000 clients and, you know, about 70 people on staff uh, with all the different, you know, people we work with. So it's I feel really blessed. Uh, and I feel blessed because... You know, the the products, the strategies and the principles that we believe in are still relevant to this day, because whether you're a doctor making eight, you know, seven figures, whether you're, you know, just getting out of college with a bunch of debt, financial principles are principles. They don't change. And when you learn those, then you can adapt your financial strategies to get uh, the highest six, you know, the uh, outcomes that are. Uh, most probable to be successful. And, and we continue, you know, to see different, you know, cryptocurrency over the last, you know, five, six years has been this buzzword and novelty. Uh, and I think there's, it's really interesting. At the same time, people got into a lot of trouble, right? And lost a lot of money, lost a lot of investments. Markets have curtailed and gone through quite a bit in the last several years, especially this year, 2022, people are still following the status quo and they're still getting lackluster results. And I don't think it's right. I think there people need to know that there are other solutions out there. There are ways of setting up your finances so that you don't have to just place your financial future in uh, you know the, the hands of probability and chance. I think there's more certain ways to do it. I know there are more certain ways to do it. Sure, definitely. Yeah, so that's interesting. You know, uh, Paradigm Live has been almost like almost two decades now. So there's a lot of learning curve, wow. I guess, hopefully, and a lot of people are getting help. Wow, it's 8,000 clients. I didn't know that. So that's that's big. Um, so, yeah, again, congratulations for whatever you've done, yeah, you know, and great company to definitely be part of. Uh, the next one, the, the, the topic that we want to dive in and which have changed my life and my thought process is something I really want to talk to Patrick today is a whole life policy. And uh, many of us have heard about like life insurance, which is, you know, kind of one of the basic, I would say, and in, in, especially in the United States, uh, where we live, there's a lot of, you know, people that we have a lot of things we have to worry about. One of the things we worry about our family protection, which is life insurance. And I wanted to ask you, uh, Patrick, about, the, I guess the basic thing we're going to talk about, what is whole life policy? What is the difference between whole life and term life? And focus on what, what is cash value over funded dividend paying policy. That's what I'm in. And I wanted to hear from you, you know, start with the, the policy, the whole life. Well, we can start with, we can start with the basics. You know, it, it, life insurance, right, is, is basically insurance on somebody's life. So if somebody passes away, money gets paid out to a beneficiary and that beneficiary can use the money, you know, in a lump sum, they can use it in installments. Ultimately it's to replace the financial value of the person that passed away. And there's different types of life insurance. Uh, you have term life insurance, which is kind of like renting insurance. Uh, you have it for a period of time and then it goes away. Uh, whole life is forever. And so when you have that type of policy, as long as you pay premiums, whether it's, you know, in the short term or when you're 110 years old, it'll, it'll pay out to an appointed beneficiary, which could be a person. It could be a trust. Uh, so that's kind of the, the nuts and bolts of, of whole life. But there are different elements of whole life that separates it from other financial products because it doesn't do just one thing. It does many things. And so that, you know, I explained the first thing is it, it pays out a financial amount of money regardless of when uh, the in person that's insured passes on. But it also accumulates cash. Uh, it accumulates a liquid value that you can either withdraw uh, or another uh, feature that it has that sets it apart is you can borrow against it. So the and there's a, a long history of this dating back to the early 1900s. Uh, but 
insurance companies guarantee contractually guarantee a loan at a really uh, low interest rate against that value with incredible terms. There's no set payback term. Uh, it doesn't show up on a credit report. You don't have to qualify for it and it can be used for pretty much anything. So it's really valuable in so many different ways. And that's why we advocate the product. Uh, and it's not the end all be all only financial product you own, but we consider it a staple. We consider it one of the foundational things that you can own and it replaces whether it's a high yield savings account, uh, a bond fund, it replaces really where the safety and security bucket is for most investors. And it does it with more tax efficiency and even more benefits. And then it just allows you know, allows people to have, I would say, a, a, a higher degree of peace of mind when it comes to their finances. And it also, you know, I would I'd say allows for the uncertainties of life. I mean, I think we're wired to survive. So we're not always thinking about death, but death is in the background. We know that it's possible. We know that our bodies are vulnerable, right, to, you know, the environment that we live in. And accidents happen. And we've seen a lot of them, obviously, as, you know, as a company, uh, but people know, even though the likelihood is kind of small, people know that it's an inevitability. And so having something that pays out to their loved ones is something people are compelled to do. Now, this is all going in a different direction. You know, when I first started sure. you know, advocating uh, whole life, especially the way we design it with high, high cash value, like people do not like whole life. They don't like it. They they think it's a ripoff. They they think they're getting, uh, you know, the rug pulled out, you know, under, from under them. And I found that really surprising. And it and it it took me back, and it actually caused me to second guess and triple guess what I was doing. But if you're able to evaluate it objectively, mathematically, you're able to run scenarios, run simulations with math, and then compare that against alternatives. Like it, it is, it's one of the most magical financial products that exists. And it, and that's been our mission is to really help people see that instead of succumb to, you know, what most people think about it, which is based on what they're told by, you know, their financial advisor or some other financial guru. So, but it's been a, it's, it's been a great business and it's helped a lot of people. And, you know, it's still just as relevant today, if not more uh, than it was when we started. And so, but yeah, it, it takes a little bit of study and open-mindedness to really say, okay, am I, is my opinion about whole life, like based on me doing some due diligence and analysis and evaluation objectively, or am I basing my perception of whole life on what somebody told me <laughs> or what I looked on, you know, Google and, and found somebody talking, you know, bad about it anyway. So it's, yeah, it's, been, it's sure. been fun. So we do a lot of video webinars to like show the math behind it so people can understand and feel better about it. You're listening to the Dream Big and Think Different podcast with Dr. Sachin Maskey. Be sure to stop by SachinMaskeyMD.com to download a free copy of Dr. Maskey's book, yeah, absolutely. So I have gone through the process and how I got involved. I took me almost at least eight meetings to understand <laughs> how exactly it works. And, uh, and eventually I decided to go with you guys because I was learning so many things that I was not able to find out the, the, the strong, powerful methods from the whole life policy, which I am doing for myself right now. I, I mean, you're going to believe I bought my first, uh, like not first car, but my car from my policy. <laughs> and... Uh, Yes, I did that. And I bought my property, uh, rental property from the whole life policy. So there's something called dual asset strategy. We're going to talk about in a few minutes, but I just wanted to grill more about the major difference between whole life and term. Because people get, when, when I talk about my friends calling, the, you know, when I get together and all that, a lot of people don't like about whole life policy. Number one is, is expensive. That's the first thing that comes into mind. The premium is almost four times or almost 10 times expensive than the term life for sure. I want you to give us a little bit, uh, you know, I guess both have the pros and cons, but why whole life is better in terms of, you know, overall strategy, because it's a long-term legacy building, as you said, just to talk about a little bit about the difference between term and whole life. Yeah. The example I used before is probably what, 
what resonates the most, which is, you know, whole life is like owning a house right. and it, term life is like, you're like renting a house. Renting. Uh, another interesting thing is, you know, term life, uh, it's, I think the statistics are 99% of people who have term life, like the, the policy never pays out. And then whole life, obviously it's meant to pay out regardless of when, uh, when you pass on. So you can argue expense. Right. So you can argue the expense of like, OK, you can you can rent. The rent is likely going to be less than a mortgage payment, a down payment uh, and, uh, you know, having the expenses associated with owning a home. At the same time, you build equity in a home. Right. You build equity. You have tax benefits. Right. And, you know, ultimately you can sell the home in the future and have that equity. Right. Uh, that doesn't happen with term. It doesn't happen with renting. Right. You can't you know, if you're in a home. And renting the house, you can't sell the house. Like you don't own the asset. The whole life is when you own, you know, you own an asset. It's a dollar amount that's going to be passed on to a future generation. But the equity piece, that's the cash piece, right? So we design most policies uh, and it depends, right? Because the, the actual policy itself, there's several strategies that you can use it for. Mm -hmm. But the most common one is a, is a growth vehicle, right? where you build cash value, you have a permanent death benefit, okay, and you can use that cash value uh, as your savings vehicle, as your reserve account, but you can also use it as like, you know, a family bank, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. It could finance, you know, car purchases, down payments on homes, the sky's the limit, as opposed to using uh, creditors, okay? So the idea is like, there's several uses to it, uh, but whole life, you know, from the expensive standpoint, the premium is higher, okay, but you get more for the premium, whereas a term premium is much lower, but you get much less for what you're paying for. So it's kind of like, you know, what's the best? All right, I'll use another example. This might not be the greatest example, but it's that whole saying of uh, most expensive lawyer is the is the cheapest. <laughs> yeah. I love right? that. I like it. <laughs> Uh, it could be you know, something akin, uh, akin to that, right? So you have to look at, all right, what am I getting for what I'm paying for? And you get much more with whole life than you get with uh, with term. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So guess what? I, what I did was uh, just to share my uh, my experience with whole life. I didn't buy for myself. I bought for my wife and my children too. And mm -hmm. guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to buy for my grandkids. And the reason I want to do that is because it's a no brainer. I guess I have done a lot of research on this myself and I we can throw out that Rockefeller's family, you know, uh, I guess one of the most influential family, they, all the family are mostly billionaires and, you know, they have donated more than like 50% of our national parks. And those family has been using this strategy, something called Rockefeller's method. Who's gonna, we're going to talk about it. But yeah, it's a powerful vehicle. And uh, I wanted to just uh, bring four basic advantages of whole life policy that I've learned. Number one is a liquidity, like, you know, like a bank, you know, you can put money in the bank and, and, and have access to any time. For example, my policy, which I have built with you guys, I'm actually accessing today. I'm actually accessing money from my policy. And it took me less than like three days to get the, the, the cash value. So liquidity is, is a major advantage, I think, number one. Number two, I have found is something called protection, which I think we talked about a little bit. So this is a bankruptcy if you file uh, or if you're, you know, get sued. I think that money is protected. And the most of the state, it belongs to, you know, nobody can touch that money as long as, you know, it's there. And again, the other thing I wanted to touch best with about whole life is something called dual asset strategy, uh, which is basically, you know, when you borrow money from whole life, interesting thing is that the cash value still grows at a minimum 4%. That's, that's a rate I think I, it goes through. And, and you can invest that money to in, uh, income producing asset. And guess what? The money is growing two different places at the same time. <laughs> so that's a powerful strategy, you know. And last thing I want to mention is that that benefit was just tax free, you know. So, so I, I guess those are the four things I learned. I don't know if there's anything you can add on that. Yeah, like I said, there's there's a lot of benefits. Those are I would say the the fundamental ones. And it, so I look at it as you know you could use it you know specifically with your kids. It, it could be their college fund too, right? My right. my oldest is uh, you know she's graduating this year and uh, she's likely you know, going to do some, some specialty school as opposed to 
uh, it's going to be through college, but it's like some specialty design programs. But it's like, yeah, I, I've never had a 529 plan uh, for my kids. I've only used this vehicle, and there's a lot of there's a lot of money in there, right? Uh, and it's probably more it's more than what her college is going to cost. Mm-hmm. Okay, and but at the same time, it's like there's no restrictions to how you use it. Whereas like a 529 plan, you have to use it for college expenses. Right or education expenses, or else you have to pay some, you know penalties associated with it. Yeah. But also, has taught me, you know, going to the Rockefeller method, right? Which is, you know, I've taught my kids from an early age, right, that money is about exchange, right? Money exists mm-hmm. because value was created. When money is spent on value, okay, there's opportunity costs associated with that. Okay, so my kids have learned how to buy things and then be responsible for paying them back. Right. Now it's not everything that they buy, but some of the big purchases that they've that they've had. And that's the expectation of college, right? Is money is there, okay, but the purpose of that money is to be able to pay for college, but the expectation is that they will be responsible for uh, paying that money back uh, when they graduate, when they get a job. So what it does is it creates you know, the system itself creates some discipline associated with money, right? And I'm not saying that, you know, you need that to be disciplined, but human behavior, I would say to be consistent requires systems because human behavior, you know, we're in, we're in a lot, a big part of us is, is animal and we're instinctive and we make irrational choices, right? So, (laughs) and with money, money is not an exception. I mean, I still am just baffled at some of the situations I see with people who make a lot of money and have no idea where it goes. It's like at the end of the month, they're like, I don't like, we should have more money left over, but we don't. It's just, it's just gone. So it's like, you know, people really, you know, are, are driven uh, in a certain way biologically that if you don't rein it in, it has some pretty unintended consequences. Yep. So it's having a system like this system payback, the family bank system, right? It helps create discipline associated with the money that's spent. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to dig more about the Rockefeller's method. Before that, I guess, uh, uh, so uh, infinite banking concept, I, I, I guess a lot of people have heard this term and uh, I just wanted to uh, you to explain us how you can use utilizing a whole life policy and which is a beautiful concept uh, we which we a little bit talk about it but l- let's talk about a little bit more detail and how we can do that with the whole life policy yeah so th- i would say the example that i just gave is you know kind of represents what the infinite banking concept is that that is a it's a proprietary term right uh and and so it was it was developed by a, a man who uh, passed on a few years ago uh, nelson nash he popularized yeah, this strategy it, it it existed before him. Not to take anything away from him, it existed before him, uh, but he's the one that really you know advocated it, popularized it, uh, and really shifted uh, and a faction of financial services to embrace you know the idea of whole life and using it in a certain way, using that product in a certain way. At the same time, you know, over the years, you know, we we have a lot of clients who are in their 50s and 60s and 70s and whole life is applicable and beneficial to them outside of in, infinite banking. So and infinite banking is a strategy. It's a way to use a uh, whole life, not the only way. OK, so just depending on the circumstances of the family or the individual, it may or may not be uh, appropriate. But looking at, I would say, in our modern times, most people become accustomed to using financing to make purchases. Financing a home, financing a business, financing school, financing a car, credit cards, the list The list goes on. Boats, RVs, okay? So financing is a big part of our culture, our society. Mm-hmm. And this is a way in which you can kind of turn the tables because banks are statistically driven and they know people are going to pay them a lot of interest over the course of time. Uh, And whether it's credit cards or bank loans, et cetera, this is a way in which you can kind of take back control of financing. Not to say that you finance everything with insurance policies, but you have the option. 
And when you have that option, it allows you to evaluate the costs of purchasing, whether it's a car, whether it's a home, whether it's college. It helps you evaluate it at a different level, but it also creates flexibility, which banks are rarely flexible. Okay, if you get in a bind with a bank, mm-hmm. okay, you can't make a payment, you can't make another payment, it messes up your credit, banks uh, repossess the asset, it's not pretty. Right. And life happens to all of us, there's going to be circumstances, whether they've happened already or whether they'll happen in the future, where we're going to lose a job, we're going to lose our income and may not be able to make a payment to a bank. Having this strategy where you have incredibly flexible loan terms allows you peace of mind so that you don't default on an asset default on a loan which puts the asset in jeopardy. So it's another again it's having options is always going to lead to a a more accurate uh, and superior choice. When you just have one choice of using a bank, it's like you're bound right to their terms regardless of what happens in your life. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, totally, totally. So yeah, I I I I learned that Nelson Nash has more than 60 policies in his lifetime. <laughs> I have only four right now, but I'm planning to get more eventually and uh yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, to, that's the, down, um, the downside. Yeah, and I would say that's a drawback of when you do a when you do a policy, there's only so much you can add to it from a financial standpoint. The IRS regulates it. And so each policy has a limitation of what you can add. Now, so in order to add more, you have to have additional additional policies. Sure, sure. We're going to talk about, about a little bit more about the policy in a few minutes. Getting back to the Rockefeller's method, and what do you think about that? And I, I am actually trying to build that in my portfolio too, which I can share with everyone today listening. But uh, I'm actually bringing one of the asset protection attorney, Andrew Howell, who is a great guy. And I don't know yeah. if you, ha- you know him, but he's, yeah. So he's going to build me and help me build my strategy on that. Uh, something called oh, cool. Rockefeller's family banking concept. Uh, and uh, I want to hear your thoughts on that. How you, what do you think about that? Yeah, Andrew's my Andrew's my attorney as well. So he's a really, really good guy. Yeah, the 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 Rockefeller, so they popularized what's known as a, a family office. And a family office is, is comprised of pretty much every financial services role, whether it's asset management, investing, uh, personal development, insurance, management. I mean, it's it's the gamut. And so the Rockefellers, you know, created this model financially, right, where they will be able to pass on wealth into infinitum. And, you know, they whole life is not their only asset, right? However, every single one of the uh, heirs to the Rockefeller, you know, Rockefeller dynasty uh, has a whole life. And I, I'm not supposed to mention the carrier. Uh, I mentioned that once and they got upset with us for some reason. I'm like, who, who cares? Why does that matter? But anyway, it's like they, you know, they use whole life, they use dividend paying whole life, all, all of their heirs uh, have it from from birth. And that's, that's the other challenge, right? Is that as you get older, your insurability uh, is in jeopardy, mm-hmm. right? So you can't just buy insurance, you have to actually qualify it, uh, qualify for it. So they typically start policies when uh, when children are uh, are young. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's one of those. The idea is that over the course of time, right, throughout this person's life, they're used, they're taking money from the trust, right? They're pulling whether it's assets or income. It could be it's might most likely coming from other investments inside the, the family office. But then what the whole life policy does is it replenishes the money that they took and more when they pass on. Exactly. So so basically what uh, Patrick was saying was uh, there's uh, so so the trust in our case, I'm not sure you're done the same way, but there's something called living trust. And then, you, you know, what happens is my beneficiary for my whole life policy is a trust. So everything, when something happens to me or my, my kids or every, everyone, the beneficiary should be the, the family trust that we created. And, and, and when, when somebody passes away, the trust gets the, the whole, the, the benefit, that benefit. And the way it works, I guess, in my understanding, uh, is the, the family or the whole, like your, your heirs can access to that trust in a such a way that they wanted to borrow the money from the trust and then, and, and eventually, you know, do the same strategy to give back. So 
that way the money keeps on growing, you know. <laughs> so that's what I, you know, understood. And thank you for explaining a beautiful concept. So uh, let's talk about the cash value. There's a long word here. Cash value, dividend paying, mutual uh, whole life policy. Like I wanted to broke down, break down all this thing. And you can probably explain much better because you do this all the time. So yes, yeah, so I'll go to the, I'll go to the first term. So, so cash value. So if you have a whole life policy, the cash value is what you get if you cancel the policy. So going back to that real estate example, okay, if you own a piece of real estate and it, it has equity, when you sell the home, okay, you don't get the full value of the home. You just get the equity, mm-hmm. right? So the cash value of life insurance is, is, its, uh, is its equity, mm-hmm. okay? And that's the amount that you can borrow against. Okay. Uh, it's the amount that also earns uh, dividends. So now I'll go to dividends. Dividends is, it's a non-guaranteed before, annual. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. You before you go to questions. the dividends, sorry, I forgot to mention overfunded. Like, you know, there's a very, mm-hmm. very important concept here that I didn't know before. I used to have a whole life policy before I joined you guys. But what I realized that major difference is the overfunding part. And that's what I think we should a little bit talk about before we go to dividends. Yeah, so I, so I'd first say that you know even if you have whole life that's not overfunded, uh, it doesn't mean that it's a bad thing, right? It it right. just it it has less cash value and more death benefit, but you can you can design whole life so it has more cash value than the typical policy, right? And so there are specific uh, additions that you can make that go right into cash value, uh, earn interest from day one and build uh, dividends. Okay. So not to go into a lot of detail, but yeah, we, we typically design from a growth strategy. We typically design for the highest amount of cash value within the IRS's restriction. So the, the tax code has restricted, it's kind of like the premium to death benefit ratio. So we try to stay at that limit to have maximum maximum cash value because typically the initial strategies we advocate are more growth oriented. Uh, so that's why we go that direction. At the same time, we have you know clients who are in their 50s, their 60s, or 70s who have accumulated wealth, and it's a different strategy when you're solving for income, sure, uh, lifetime income, income for life, and so sometimes the designs maybe more death benefit and less cash value. So it really depends, but because you're, you know, younger, getting going, you're building wealth, you're not in the distribution of wealth phase yet. Okay, it's more prone we're more prone to advocate higher cash value type of policies. Sure. And then there's something called MEC limit that that I think uh, we can touch best that with 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 a little bit. I mean you just mentioned it, but it's called MEC limit, uh, right? Yeah, and it's again it's the it's government acronyms, which are confusing and it's a confusing term, but yeah, MEC is an acronym. It's that IRS limit, but a MEC stands for modified endowment contract. So right. it's one of those, like I just say IRS imposed limit because that's easier to understand than modified endowment contract, which not nobody understands. I don't even think they understand what that means. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's beautiful because uh, because initially I wasn't aware of all of those things when I had a whole lot of policy. I had a policy, but I wasn't doing anything else <laughs> with the policy. So when I started learning these new terms and new strategies, I was like fascinating to me. Why I wasn't doing 10 years ago, you know, my financial would be uh, totally different, you know. But anyways, so I think it's beautiful to learn about so many things. Uh, uh, so we talk about uh, cash value. We talk about uh, dividend. I don't think we talk about dividend paying. So can you just uh, give some insight on dividend paying? Like how that works in whole life? Sure. So a, div- a dividend, most people know what a dividend is. A dividend is profits. And so these policies receive dividends and those dividends represent profits of the insurance company. And so these are mutual companies like you uh, had mentioned. Mutual companies are technically owned by specific policy owners. And those specific policy owners are the ones who receive dividends. So wh- why, I, I'm always curious this, I, I think you need to, uh, I need to learn from you today. Why mutual company specifically, not other company? 
why would you choose mutual company? So mutual, yeah, mutual companies, if you look at other company ownership, other insurance company ownership is typically stock or shareholders. Okay. So if you, and I'm not sure which, yeah, the most, ins- if you look at like a, you know, a Transamerica as, as an example or Lincoln, mm-hmm. okay, you can buy stock, right? On, on the, in the equity markets and own a share of that company. Mm-hmm. And then when the value of the company goes up or they make a profit, they typically pay a dividend for each share that is owned. Okay. Mutual companies are private companies. Okay. They're not owned by any shareholders. Okay. They're technically owned uh, in trust by uh, the policy owners. Okay. That own a uh, whole life. And there's some companies where if you own disability insurance, you also give a div- uh, get a dividend. But primarily with whole life policies, uh, that's where they get the majority of those dividends. And also they're around for more than 100, 100 years. Like Penn Mutual, for example, I think they're around for almost 100 years ago, right? <laughs> so it's like pretty- I think, Yeah, I think they're 100 and and 50. And they, wow. the whole mutual concept is really old, is really old because- these were, you know, most insurance companies were churches, were developed by churches or communities mm-hmm. where people essentially pooled money, okay? And if somebody uh, in a family died, then money would go to that uh, that family, okay? Right. And then profit from investment would be distributed on a pro rata basis to all of the different uh, families, if there was excess. Right. So that's, you know, that tradition has continued to this day with, you know, whether it's Penn Mutual, New York Life, Northwestern Mutual, Guardian, uh, One America, there's a couple of others as well. There's not very many uh, anymore, but there's a handful that are still uh, follow that model, that financial model. Sure. So we're um, so regarding uh, regarding the policy. Uh, one last question about the policy: uh, When is the good time to get the policy? Just so listener knows about this. Is there too late to get the policy when somebody is sixty years old? Because I thought to myself, the whole life policy to be should get an early age. You know, what do you suggest on that? Yeah, it depends. It it, it depends on the strategy. Uh, if you're insured, it's usually around seventy five. Uh, in, sorry, insurable, so you're healthy to qualify for one. Mm-hmm. Uh, usually it's around 75 years old, right, where it still makes sense. But the strategy is different. So if you're, let's say you're, you know, 70 years old and you have, you know, a life expectancy of 30 years, okay, the idea is that the life insurance policy is to be the asset that transfers to your beneficiaries. And what that allows you to do is spend all of your other assets. Okay. Mm-hmm. So let's say you had, you know, half a million dollars in assets at age 70. Okay. If you carve out some of that half a million dollars to buy a half a million dollar life insurance policy, that policy now is going to pay your beneficiaries, which allows you, you know, four or $450,000 to spend as income for those 30 years. So it's a different, it's a different strategy for a different, uh, you know, a different demographic than is likely listening to, to this. Uh, but it's one of those like, and this is like your benefit as well. So as you're, you know, accumulating cash inside policies, acquiring real estate, building your business, making investments outside, all of that wealth is going to be growing as well. But when you hit set, you know, 60, 65, 70 years old, okay, that's the, uh, wealth distribution phase of life, okay, where you're actually living off of that wealth, living off of that cash flow, mm-hmm. okay. Most people have this one lump sum of money, okay, and what's left over in that lump sum of money is what will pass on to their beneficiaries, okay. So there, it's if I take money, then I'm like, there's not enough money for them, and I'm going to run out of money. So what this does is it removes the fear that most older people have with regards to money, which is running out of money. Right. Okay. This essentially removes that fear. And that's where it's, it makes a huge impact. I mean, it's, it's still like when people get a paycheck every single month when they're 65, 70 years old, and they know that it's guaranteed for life, it does, it's, it's amazing. Like the psychological change that it makes, obviously you're experiencing it. I've experienced it at younger ages, 
But the older ages is where it makes an even more significant impact, in my opinion, because guess what? It's like we're young enough where if we lose a job or lose our income source, we'll just go find another job, right? We'll go find another income source. Right. When you're older, you don't have that option. And so that's where you have to be really strategic in the way that you allocate income, allocate assets. So like I said, you know, there's the age, it's really the situation of the individual, not necessarily the age, but when it comes to like overall accumulation, yeah, you want to start as early as possible just because, you know, compound, uh, compound interest. That's with any investment vehicle. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I, I hope the listener or whoever watching this is learning a lot about whole life policy today with the expert we have today. Um, well, almost towards the end of the show, Patrick, and it's been almost an hour. <laughs> so uh, wow. I would like to ask you my last question uh, for today's show. Where can people find you, number one? And what is the number one thing that you want to share today before you leave and share wisdom to our listener. Okay, so so paradigmlife.net is is the easiest place. Uh, so it's p a r a d i g m dot uh, uh, l i f e dot net, uh, and then the book website where you can you know there's a link to buy on Amazon, buy the audio uh, audiobook is uh, heads or tails i win dot com, and then uh, yeah the final you know the all kind of go back to the beginning you know the final piece is. Like I think people, I think all human beings are trying to figure out life. I'm trying to figure out life. And the more I try to figure it out, the more I realize how simple it is, right? Where it really comes down to your, your physical health, your mental health, uh, your relationships. That's all that really matters in my opinion. I think we get caught up in, you know, achieving uh, and get caught up in like, I don't know, just things that distract from that. And so I feel like we're so blessed to live in a time where we don't have to worry about like going hunting. It's the winter. We got to store food or else and chop firewood or else we're going to die. Like we live in just an incredible world that has produced just so much entertainment, so much uh, fun, like so much convenience and efficiency it's like, this is a holiday season. My, my recommendation is just find ways to appreciate what you have without even doing anything else. Uh, appreciate, you know, your life, appreciate your relationships, appreciate yourself that you get to have this unique experience. That's uh, that's pretty amazing. So I'll end, I'll end with that. Thank you. That was a very, very powerful message that actually gave me some goosebumps. And, and I really appreciate again, Patrick, uh, your time today. And, and, and hopefully we give some value to our listener. Uh, before we leave, thank you for your time again, and I really appreciate everyone who is listening or watching this uh, YouTube. Please uh, share with your family and uh, look forward for next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Dream Big and Think Different. We hope you enjoyed it. Please be sure to subscribe to our show so you don't miss any gold nuggets. We would appreciate it if you could rate and leave us a review on iTunes, Spotify, and other platforms. And be sure to stop by SachinMaskeyMD.com to download a free copy of Sachin's book. Until next time.